so after just one announcement, after the seminar we'll have a, a post-seminar reception. Uh, and that's going to be, I think, in the Roma Lounge, is that correct? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, <coughs> so just around the corner here. Uh, so it's uh, an honor to introduce Claire Collins. Uh, she's a professor at uh, Berkeley. Before that, uh, she was at uh, Stanford. And uh, her main area of focus is in control and, and hybrid systems. And uh, it's particularly with respect to uh, traffic management, uh, UAVs, and, and, and other systems. So she's a MacArthur Fellow, IEEE Fellow, and also about the IEEE Transportation Technologies Award. And today she's going to talk to us about safe learning in robotics. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. And um, what a great day it's been. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, for organizing my visit and hosting. Uh, it's been a real pleasure here uh, visiting um, different groups and um, from a, a wide span of um, of uh, machine learning, um, different technologies in learning and robotics, um, control, uh, really a wonderful day. So thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to come here today and I'm going to talk about a project or actually a series of projects which started quite a while ago with work that we had been doing in safety-based control without any learning. And, um, and then I'm going to, um, as we go through the talk, um, talk about projects where we've tried to incorporate um, uh, methods of learning to deal with uncertainties, different kinds of uncertainties um, and uh, you know, things that are um, coming up in the control problem. And as motivation, um, I've been working, um, well, I've been working for a long time on air traffic control problems and with NASA and the FAA on automating air traffic, automating some functionality of air traffic control. And really over the past, um, I would say about eight years, uh, there's been um, I, maybe quite a lot of pressure put on the FAA and NASA to understand how to incorporate uh, the growing numbers of UAVs that, and the growing um, interest in um, many applications of UAVs that are, of course, flying through the national airspace system. A lot of them, you know, mostly at low altitudes, um, not really interfering with air traffic, but the, the key that uh, the FAA has been interested in is how does one even um, think about um, when you're flying around cities with airports, you know, segregating airspace or understanding how to, um, how to safely deal with UAVs that are not really uh, doing maybe what they're supposed to be doing. So we've been working more recently on a number of projects with NASA on um, technologies for UAVs. One um, has been um, forced landing systems. So basically forcing a UAV to land and, and understanding the procedures and the safety for doing that. Um, we've been working on, uh, on a larger project which is designing um, airspace, so airspace segregation, but also real-time planning and organization of UAVs on plans. And um, I have some kind of uh, maybe diagrams here, you know, indicating a hybrid system model and, um, you know, route planning with um, different levels of criticality depending on whether routes are intersecting or not. There's, there's kind of some technology from existing air traffic, which is, or the existing air traffic routing system, which is interesting to think of, but it's an, I think it's a really fascinating problem because we get to design these, um, these systems by scratch. So in the, in the problems, we've been thinking about um, you know, safety. So safety, aircraft not running into each other, collision avoidance, um, aircraft operating around people um, and people doing um, you know, unexpected things or trying to understand how to do that safely. Um, we've been thinking about simplicity in the design. So how to design root structures that are um, automated or semi-automated, but that people in the loop understand or can interface with in some easy way. Um, and then also this I idea of, you know, is that the, the, the vehicles are going to be flying around environments which are um, often unstructured and how does one adapt to new information? And that's really been driving the data-driven component or the learning component that we've been working on. So, so in the talk today, I thought I'd kind of thematically separate it into um, 
two pieces. One which is um, largely based on research where we've been doing safety-based control, and the driving factor there has been dealing with high-dimensional computations and the work we've been doing there. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll move into the work where we've been um, moving towards incorporating learned techniques into the safety-based control we've been doing. And there, the ideas are really, how does one, um, how does one try to maintain some sense of a guarantee when you've got such an important part of the problem, which is data-driven. And just to say, this is uh, you know, not just UAVs. These are just two of the companies where some of my graduate students were working in this past summer. Um, Skydio, which is a flying camera, um, and uh, Neuro, which is a, an automated delivery vehicle. So again, now um, you know, safety is very important as these vehicles are operating around people, um, but they're operating and they're taking their um, cues from basically cameras that are sensing the world around them and trying to operate safely. So, so safety here is a, is a really challenging problem. Okay, so this, these are the two parts that I talked about. Um, and for safety and, and the work that we've been doing, I'm gonna talk about reachability. So I'm gonna spend the first part of the talk um, well, introducing, showing some work we've been doing in reachability, kind of example driven. And, um, and then I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, uh, segue into the learning component. Okay, so, um, so suppose you have a system, and, and the, the key background here is that you have a model of the system. So that model could be a differential equation, or it could be a finite state automaton, or it could be a hybrid system where you're combining discrete state and continuous state dynamics. But you have a model, and that model may be subject to uncertainty. Um, in differential equations, we usually capture uncertainty in this disturbances, the d vector. So the kind of disturbances, we lump it together in a vector, and we bound that. Either there's some statistical properties that we know of that disturbance, or we have um, bounds on what those variables can do, and we can work with that. Um, we also have control. So we're, um, we can come in, we can actuate the system. We have some knowledge of the control authority. That's the vector u. And we have a state space, state vector x, usually in Rn. So, so this is a, an example of a differential equation. And I've got some region I'm going to call unsafe. So this red ellipse region, uh, g at time zero. I can, I, can, I can encode, so I'm assuming that I can encode safety, or in this case, unsafety, as a subset of the state space of the system. So in the relative dynamics of a number of vehicles, any two vehicles coming closer than a certain distance is an unsafe condition, and that can be represented as, um, as a subset of the state space, um, as an example. So the backwards reachable set is the set of all states for which, for all possible control actions, there exists a disturbance or just under the dynamics of the system that um, the, the system dynamics could reach that unsafe condition, so this, this red ellipse. And, um, and so that's what we characterize as the set G at time T. It's indexed by time. So the set of states for which the system could enter that red region in T time units, or in up to T time units. And because we've got uh, you know, the authority to control parts of the system and there's parts of the system we can't control, it's like the, the control and the disturbances are players in a game and we're almost pitting control against disturbance. That's been the, I would call it, kind of robust control or game theoretic viewpoint that we've been taking in the first, this first part of the work. Okay, so the backwards reachable set is this, is this pink set, which we call G of T. Um, okay, so in older work, we've, um, we've characterized, you know, for differential equations and hybrid systems, how to compute. Well, first of all, what that set looks like mathematically and, um, and how to um, compute that set. And so the, the details aren't important here, but what is important is that there is a mathematical characterization of this set as the sub-zero level sets of a value function. That's like a value function for safety. And the, the equation describes how that value function evolves over time. It's a classical equation in control theory called the Hamilton-Jacobi-Isaacs equation. Um, Hamilton-Jacobi um, classical 
mathematicians. Isaacs, um, maybe more recent, um, sort of 1940s, 1950s, who was working in, in game theory. And so when we think about this problem of, um, of evolving a, uh, a set under a particular equation, it was um, you know, Isaacs that was looking at the disturbance component when he was looking in the 1940s at, at aircraft dogfighting. He was working for the Rand Corporation. Um, and so we, um, we use this technology and, um, and we basically use that technology to compute this, uh, this or to characterize this function. Um, and then we um, use a level set interpretation um, towards computing this function. So the idea is that a set is represented implicitly as the sub-zero level sets of a function in, in a one higher dimension. And that equation that I showed on the previous page is showing how, is describing mathematically how you would evolve that function. And at every point in time, you take the zero level set of that function, and that becomes the reachable set. And so that's the theorem with the proof. Um, so I've just shown here, you know, as that function, it started off sort of nicely characterized as a bowl, and as it evolves under the dynamics of the system with the control and disturbance computed through that Hamilton-Jacobi function, you get a, a new function and you, you take the zero level set slice. Okay, so this is nice. Um, it, de describing a set implicitly through a function is nice because you can... Um, you can represent non-convex sets. The sets don't even have to be connected together. Um, the sets can, um, uh, you can do operations on those sets by operations on the corresponding functions. So there's some nice mathematical properties of using a level set interpretation for sets of states. Okay, so we've, we've discussed a backwards reachable set, so a safety specification in terms of a region of the state space of the system. We've talked about backwards reachability as a game. We've talked about a mathematical characterization of that, and then an implementation via level set techniques. And, um, and then just two more things to say, because they come back at the end of, a, a, a bit later in the talk when we start talking about learning. Um, but um, if... Uh, if you can prove, if, if so that that set has the property that it's controlled invariant, namely that you can stay outside of it for all time, then any super zero level set of that function is also an invariant. So if you stay outside of the set, you can stay outside um, a, an over approximation of the set. So you could use over approximations to certify safety as well. And then on the converse side, the more you know about your system, so the more you know about this disturbance vector, the thing that you don't know about, the more you know, the less conservative you have to be. And so as you learn more about the disturbance, that set, you know, it usually is going to have some volume to it because there's just the raw dynamics of the system. You can't avoid that set if you're close to it. Okay. So that, those are the, sort of the points that we came up with so far. So this level set interpretation was nice because there exists a literature in um, applied math called level set techniques that have been developed um, by um, Stan Osher at UCLA, Jamie Sethian at Berkeley, and um, John Sesiklis at MIT in terms of um, basically doing propagation of these level set functions. And so we, um, and, and they've been used in, in um, areas like semiconductor processing where you're propagating one material through another. Here we're trying to propagate safe functions through a space, but we're using the same mathematical technology. So, you know, here's the set we're interested in. This is a collision avoidance, this is a set from a collision avoidance problem. Here's its level set interpretation. So um, Ian Mitchell was one of my first PhD students. He's now a professor in uh, computer science at the University of British Columbia. And um, he developed, he, um, he worked on this for his PhD thesis. And when he moved to UBC, he wrote um, a, a toolbox, which he calls the level set toolbox. You can download it. You can um, take out his dynamics, put your own dynamics in. It's well documented. You can work on both continuous and hybrid systems with this toolbox. He's got a, a lot of descriptions and examples. 
And, and there's a couple of, of nice properties. Because you're representing these sets implicitly, if um, the, the function itself gives you some useful information, like the value of the function gives you some information about how far you are away from the boundary of the set, which is useful for control. And you know whether it's negative or positive, it tells you whether you're inside the set or outside of the set. So, so you know, useful information about where you are with respect to your safety specification that's evolving because your dynamics are evolving. Okay, so that's kind of the base technology that we started that we started working with. Um, this is one of the first examples that we did. I was still a professor at Stanford, and. Um, this was back in the days before you could buy a quad rotor on every street corner. So we, we built our own. You can kind of see they're clunky. Um, there's like two computers and carbon fiber tubes, tube straps. Um, but we built our own. There's four quad rotors and four students, and they're joysticking these quad rotors around. Um, they're trying to crash into each other. But the algorithm is running on each of those quad rotors. So this is the data. And we've computed around each quad rotor are three sets. These are the three um, safety uh, reachable sets of each vehicle with respect to the other three. And so what happens is um, students are controlling them. But when one vehicle gets on the boundary of the set of another, the automation on board that quad rotor takes over and guides the vehicles away from each other. And then at some point, soon after that, gives control back to the student who has to kind of test it to, to make sure they have control. So just a, a demonstration. This is an example. Quad rotors can hover. So they can you know, basically stop and hover. And um, so the sets are particularly simple. They have, we're using the velocity of the vehicle, so you have a finite stopping time and, and to hover. And this is also a problem where the union of the three reachable sets around each vehicle represents that reachable set with respect to the union of the vehicles. And that's not always the case, that you can decouple these computations into, into these three separate computations. Okay, so you can also use this technology to reach desired states. So to compute the capture basin, the, um, the set of states that you want to reach here, the min and max in that optimization problem have been flipped. Um, and you can use them for hybrid systems where you're um, perhaps sequencing between different modes of operation. And say you'd like to reach a desired target where you have to go through several modes to get to that target, but you've also got to avoid an unsafe set. So you know, reaching while avoiding a set or doing this, what we call a reach avoid, is um, basically you can, you can use these um, uh, inequalities on the level set function. So you, you do the math on the functions instead of the sets themselves. And that's what I meant about there's some, there's some mathematical um, uh, niceties to using a function to do the computation instead of the sets themselves. OK, so let's look at an example of those, those reach avoid operators. This is, um, <clears throat> well, this is a problem where we'd like our uh, quad rotors to um, go to different points in the Bay Area from the Concord warehouse. Um, but there's a cost map over the, over the region. And, um, and airports are very expensive to fly through. Um, the kind of populated areas on the coasts are expensive. Uh, Water is fairly cheap to fly over. We're just assigning this. And um, forests are fairly cheap to fly over. So if, if the quad rotor crashes, there's um, less chance it's going to hit someone in the cheaper areas. And so you can do a simple um, fast marching method to find the shortest plan, where short is um, least cost through that cost map. And then, um, and then what we've been using is a control protocol for each quad rotor, which respects the fact that it's, you know, there may be many quad rotors flying through these routes. And these routes are, you know, what naturally comes out of the shortest path algorithm are these trunk, these kind of like highway routes with short deviations into high cost areas. So we were taking this idea from um, actually uh, mostly motivated by the California PATH program in the, the, um, in the, in the 90s, where they were automating the, um, it was a, a test run by California PATH, but automating the, automating the inner lane of California's highways. And we formed this um, 
uh, model of a single vehicle under this um, platooning based control. So there's, there's platoons of vehicles all traveling at a similar speed. Um, they're traveling on these highway routes and then the control is to either break off or join platoons. Um, the idea is that each vehicle then would only really have to satisfy constraints with respect to the vehicles close by, the vehicle in front or the vehicle behind. So respecting all those collision avoidance constraints becomes a simpler problem as you reduce the number of vehicles. So like we do on our roadways, put some structure on the, and like they do in air traffic control, it, the idea is to put some structure on the control problem so that you're reducing the number of um, of, of basically safety conditions that you have to check with. Okay, and so we, we proposed this as a control structure and then we used reachability to generate the guards, generate the guards that describe the transitions for this hybrid system. So given the state of the system, when should the vehicle um, you know, switch out of a platoon? What, um, how should they join? How do we define those? So those are all computed automatically through reachable set calculations. Um, so for example, here the two vehicles, red and blue, are trying to merge onto a highway and join a platoon. And, um, and so underlying this is the reachable set calculation. So the red vehicle has a target set it wants to reach. And then around the blue vehicle is an avoid set that's computed with respect to their relative dynamics. And we're using seven dimensional sets here, but we're showing the projections down onto two dimensions. And similarly for the blue vehicle, it has a target set it wants to reach to be able to get onto the highway, yet it has to avoid the, um, you know, the possible collision with the other vehicle. Okay, so in general, you know, the protocol when it's, it's being um, uh, performed online, it computes kind of this nice smooth organic motion of these vehicles to the, to the highway specified. Here we're not showing the sets, but they're being computed in the background. And if there's an intruder, for example, that's not following the rules of the road, then as um, it's set, as they you know, detect that this vehicle is perhaps going faster, so it's going faster, it's set, uh, is, is bigger in front of it, as it, that set first touches the vehicles, they know at that point, assuming they can sense that, that they have to avoid. And so they break off from the highway and then join again later once that vehicle has passed. Okay, so, um, so let me spend just a few minutes talking about the curse of dimensionality. So this is a computation. We're basically solving a value function. We're, we're computing this safety value function over time. It's, um, it's a numerical computation, so we're gridding. I mean, in, in general, there are a few cases, linear quadratic control, right, where you can come up with analytic solutions to some of these optimal control problems, but in general, it's not. It's a numerical problem that you have to solve. It's continuous dynamics, a continuous time problem. Um, you know, even for hybrid systems, you've got this uh, continuous dynamic part. So, so it involves gridding up the state space, and um, and there have been a number of um, research projects in the, I would say, you know, mostly in the hybrid systems community, but, but um, you know, uh, at, at the interface of control and computer-aided verification that have been seeking efficient solutions to this kind of reachability or model checking problem. And um, I'm not listing an exhaustive set of research here, more just um, sort of a, a, a set of categories where people have been working. And I'll say a few words. We've done a, a few different things, and some of them I think are um, you know, more recent that I'll talk about. One of them is um, the idea, and I was talking to a couple of people about this earlier today, that we, um, so, so the, it requires gridding up the state space, so the computation is exponential, the, the level set computation is exponential in the dimension of the continuous state space. Um, so that means that you know, the higher the, the continuous state dimension, the more, say the more vehicles that you have and your state dimension gets bigger and bigger, the uh, more impossible that computation becomes. And, and you know, realistically, without doing any kind of logic or any, um, any fancy things, we can do computations in the level set toolbox of up to about five continuous dimensions. So it's not high, I mean, many different modes of behavior, but five in a reasonable amount of time, and that's, that's not very high. So we've been exploring different ways to, um, 
to uh, work with this, over approximations, under approximations. But one idea that's, I think, um, quite neat, although we haven't explored it to a great extent yet, it's fairly new work, is that of decomposing the system dynamics. So say a 10-dimensional state space could be decomposed into um, you know, a couple of uh, lower, like a five-dimensional and a five-dimensional, and that makes a computation possible, for example. So using this example, let's just sort of illustrate that. Um, suppose you had a system, this is, this is not a system for which you'd want to do decomposition, but it's something that we can visualize in the full dimension as well as the decomposition, so let's use it. So simple Dubin's car model. Um, and we ask, does the system have what we'll call self-contained subsystems? So the, um, the idea is that the evolution, a, a self-contained subsystem is, is one in which the evolution of that system only depends on the variables within that system itself. So you could, for example, do that 3D computation, and that's what we would do normally, but you could also break it down into two two-dimensional computations. So you see here, I've overlapped the variable theta and the variables theta and u in those two subsystems, but each of those is self-contained. Each of those um, systems, I can compute based on only variables within each of those systems. So the idea is, and, and it's, you can't just do this straight off, it, um, it has to satisfy certain conditions, but suppose you then did two two-dimensional subsystems, that's much faster, even in you know, three dimensions is something that we can do quickly, but, but two two-dimensional subsystems done in parallel is much faster than doing one three-dimensional subsystem, and then find some way to kind of stitch the result together to, to get the exact reachable set in 3D. Okay, so, so here's that example again, so x, y, and theta. Um, suppose the target set, the set you either want to reach or avoid, can also be represented as the back projection of two, um, the intersection of the back projection of two lower dimensional sets. Meaning that, you know, I can completely describe this set by the back projections of um, its lower dimensional representation in the x theta and y theta spaces. Then, um, so this is, um, this is the, the backwards reachable set, basically computed through those back projections. Um, and then what I'd like to be able to do then is actually do that reachable set computation in the lower dimensional state spaces. So let's just show that again. So what I did was I computed in, I, in the two two-dimensional regions, I computed a reachable set in one two-dimensional space, the reachable set in the other two-dimensional space, and then I just computed the back projection. So um, in this case, you can prove that you get an exact representation by doing that operation. Um, and the complexity, basically, you reduce the complexity by one dimension in this case. Well, it's, it's more interesting now that we can go to higher dimensional systems and do these computations for dimensions that we weren't able to do before. So this is, um, <coughs> this is a six-dimensional quadrotor, and we've broken it down to two four-dimensional systems, and then we've used um, another technology, which we call mixed, implicit, explicit. I'm not going to talk about that today, to finally break it down to two two-dimensional subsystems. So these are things that we can do in real time, and then back project to get a representation of the six-dimensional set, which six dimensions we could do before, but it, 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 it takes about 20 hours if you just do it straight for a reasonable gridding of the state space. Um, Representing these sets is, is a little complicated because we're representing 6D sets. So we'll just say that you know, we can compute that. And then we've got that informational structure. We still have those. So what we've computed are these level set functions. We still have representations of you know, what's inside, what's outside, how far you are away on the boundary, depending on what your state is in real time. This is a 10-dimensional near hover quadrotor, um, which we do the, now do the computation in two three-dimensional subsystems and one one-dimensional subsystem. Okay, so, um, and we also have a kind of corresponding um, representation in, you know, different dimensions of that, of what the set looks like. Okay, so this is, um, it's a, a technology that, you know, works in some cases. It works if you're trying to avoid the union of sets. It works if you're trying to reach the intersections of sets. So there's different qualifications. But it also only works if you can basically find good um, subsystem representations. They don't, and, you know, what's different from what's been done before is those subsystems 
can overlap. You saw in these examples that there were shared variables, even control variables can be shared between the subsystems. Um, but, but trying to understand the structure of the differential equations so that you can use this, that's a challenging problem. It's something that we're working on that we don't have a really good set of um, you know, general answers to yet. Okay. Um, I'm going to show one more set of examples that is based on reachability but kind of leads us into the learning component of the talk. And this is very recent work that we've been doing on um, how we might exploit offline computation and reachability and use it online. So if we have the time to do a pre-computation offline, we could do that, come up with the data structure of the level set, and then use it in real-time planning, and perhaps even use it in systems that are learning about their environment. So I'm going to just show us um, kind of the, what we're doing and an example there, and then I'll move into um, the, the more, um, I would say, uh, learning components of the talk. So this um, is example three. Um, and we, we've had a lot of great discussions throughout my talks today about different planning algorithms and people doing different really cool things in robotic motion planning. Um, and I, I haven't worked a lot in planning, and this is something, as I said, it's sort of a, a project that we've been working on maybe for about the past year and a half. Um, and the idea is, um, let's start here. So fast planning. Usually fast planners like, um, like A-star or RRT, they're, they're based on really simple models of the system, right? It's just like a point moving through space, maybe with some velocity bounds. Um, but they're, you know, the, the, the model, the dynamic system is, is just a point. And so what's usually done is you come up with a, a fast plan that describes feasibility with respect to an environment. So that's the challenging part, is finding a, a path through a, a, an um, obstacle-ridden environment but then you're kind of relying on the fact that your system can track that. So, you know, the dynamics might actually crash into one of the obstacles. And so what do we do? We, we bloat obstacles um, through some way of bloating obstacles. Um, control theorists are usually, you know, maybe a more pedantic crowd. And we um, will use, you know, dynamic models and optimal control. Um, we get some guarantees, but things are so slow because we're using higher dimensional models that they don't usually work in real time. So the idea that we came up with was to use this uh, um, concept of reachability and carry around two models of the system, like a point mass model, something really simple that you can do fast planning with, and a more complex model which describes the dynamics of the system. Compute the relative error between those two models. It's a dynamic model with dimension the same as the higher dimensional model. So the, those are the relative dynamics of the the, the dynamics between the high order model and the low order model, and then compute a tracking error bound ahead of time based on those relative dynamics. And that tracking error bound is computed um, based on, um, well, what, what is that tracking error bound? It's basically describing the maximal distance in the state variables that one model could be away from another model when you know, tracking a path. And that's path invariant, that set. So we can compute that set ahead of time and then carry it around with us while we're using the low dimensional model for planning. All right, so the idea is maybe um, conceptualized a bit better here. We pre-compute this tracking bound. So here's um, a level set function, V, um, and we're just gonna show the, if I just hit return, that should work. So basically I've computed, this is, um, uh, well, I'll show on the next slide, but this is computed from a high uh, relative dynamics, high order model, low order model. I'm computing the relative um, uh, dynamics between those two, and I'm using it to propagate this set over time. Um, I can, I, as we know from reachability, we can incorporate control and disturbance variables. So in this case, the, um, the planning system is like our disturbance variable. It's going to try to you know, pull away from the system, the high dimensional system that's tracking it. So that's trying to maximize this to make this bound as large as possible. Um, and the tracking system, the one that's trying to track the plan, is the, um, the one that's trying to minimize this cost, to try to get closer and closer to the planning system. 
Okay, so we, um, we compute that. We, I, I better animation on the next slide here. Okay, so, so let's sort of picture this. Suppose we had three bounds that we were interested in. So there's a blue, a purple, and a red bound. Each is larger than the previous. And each is representing a maximum distance that I would like my um, tracking model to be away from my planning model. And so if we look at that, the, each of those three regions, each is a level set function. We compute the, we do a backwards reachable set on that, um, on that function using the relative dynamics of the system. And we find that there's, um, there's no reachable set, there's no controlled invariant set within the smallest tracking error bound. That means that with the dynamics, the relative dynamics that I have between the higher order model and the lower order model that I used for this computation, there was no um, way for the tracking system to um, stay within this bound, this um, 0.5 bound of the planning system. But for the larger bounds, there is actually some volume that remains in that region. And so reachability not only tells me where I have to stay, but it gives me a control law to keep me within that tracking error bound. So once you've done that computation ahead of time, now you can take that set, and that set is not often, you know, um, you know it's, it looks, it's computed via the dynamics of the system, so it may look a little non-intuitive, but that provides kind of the bound that you want to carry around with you when you're doing planning using the low dimensional model. So now you can plan with a low dimensional model using RRT or using A star, but you have to, in order to maintain the guarantees, you have to keep sort of put this buffer around you, which is the pre-computed tracking error bound. So it's like you know what people have done in terms of buffering out obstacles, and we actually do put the, the buffer on the obstacles, but it's, um, but it's done, that buffer is computed using reachability instead of a more heuristic way. Okay, so here's 10-dimensional quadrotor, which is a tracking a 3D point source. And so we've pre-computed the 10-dimensional um, tracking error bound. When that 10-dimensional set is projected down into the XYZ space, it just looks like a cube. But that's the set that we're going to propagate over time. And so there's obstacles. It's trying to reach a goal on the right-hand side. Um, and it's, um, it's basically we've got the, the green star, which represents the planning model, and then the tracking model, you can see kind of the end of that blue line is where the higher dimensional, 10 dimensional system is. So, so the idea then is that if you could do this pre-computation ahead of time, you could use it for fast planning with guarantees, um, and, um, and it, you know, here's a picture from our paper where uh, we compare it with, you know, doing the pre-computed low dimensional plan and then just using an LQR controller. You're not guaranteed, of course, with the LQR controller that you're going to, on the real system, that you're going to stay within the bound. Whereas with ours, because we've pre-computed this tracking error bound, we are always going to stay within that bound. But you can start to do more, more interesting things. Suppose you had not just two models, but a couple of different models. Suppose you had a really low dimensional model for wide open spaces. So you could you know, afford a big tracking error bound around you. Um, but then you wanted to go into more narrow corridors where um, you're not going to be able to have such a big tracking error bound. So you may not want to switch immediately to your high dimensional um, dynamic model, you may want to use a, like a little bit better kinematic model, for example. So then you've got you know, your tracking error bound between your 3D point source and your 10-dimensional model, and then you've got a second tracking error bound between your kinematic model and your um, high-dimensional model. And reachability not only tells you um, that you'll stay within that bounds, it can also be used to compute when you have to switch to your more careful, what turns out to be kind of a slower planning model. So you can go from um, you know, a wider tracking error bound with a simpler model to a smaller tracking error bound with a more complicated planning model. And the, the student, um, uh, Sylvia Herbert, working on this, she was reading the, um, 
the, in the psychology literature, this idea of planning or thinking fast and slow. So the idea of being able to plan or inspired by that, being able to plan in wide open spaces quickly and then switch to, you know, really sort of cognitively thinking about your plan when you have more constraints. So the idea is to try to um, use that to inspire robot motion planning. So we call this fast track for fast and safe planning. And recently, we've applied this to um, moving around people. Uh, this, is, um, this is a project where we wanted to use fast track for more realistic obstacles and things we couldn't really have. You know, So static obstacles are fairly easy, but things that are moving around where we don't really have good models of what they're doing. And so in the past year, this is joint work with Anka Dragan. Um, we've been working on. Um, developing obstacles which are really moving obstacles. They're uh, regions around pedestrians moving around the lab um, where we think they might be in the next few time points and then doing fast track planning using um, you know, this sort of high to low dimensional model for the quad rotors flying around these, these uh, motions of, of people. And, and the models that we're using are, um, uh, well, they're they're, they've been used a lot in motion planning around people. Um, they're um, what we would call noisily rational human models. So just um, you know, taking the quad rotor away from the equation for a second and looking at the, the person, the person is trying to get to the door. Let's represent the goal of the people as some, it may have many possible goals. So theta represents the possible, a vector of possible goals. The human has possible actions that they can take. Um, and um, we'd like to compute kind of the high probability actions and maybe the low probability actions. So high probability would be a fairly straight path probably towards the door. Low probability would be you know, where they might go. It's um, maybe not on that straight path. And the idea behind this, and this is a, a, the particular encoding that we're using is something that's been used a lot in the robotic motion planning around people literature quite recently, um, having its roots in mathematical psychology. Um, but it's a model, a, a Boltzmann model, so from physics, which is basically um, representing the fact that the probability of a human action is um, exponentially more likely the more efficient that action is for achieving the goal. Okay, so that's what that exponential is saying. And, um, and there's a parameter, beta, in that, that's like the inverse temperature parameter from the Boltzmann model. Um, and that parameter is typically fixed. It's, um, it's a, a parameter which can measure like the, the rationality of the, of the human or characterize the, in a single parameter, the rationality of the human for reaching that goal. So we, um, we were working with this representation um, and thinking about you know, this parameter beta. And we, um, I think the, you know, maybe the thing that we did here on that side with Anka was to um, try to characterize that parameter beta as something that we don't really know, but perhaps we could infer over time based on a set of known goals and what the person appears to be doing. So, so if they're moving in a straight direction towards a goal, that probability, we, we might sort of update beta so the probability d distribution becomes much more thinner and more focused on the straight path, whereas if they're kind of moving around randomly, we would watch that for a bit and then we would update that parameter beta so that probability distribution spreads out a little bit more and they look a little bit more irrational. So the idea is that this um, rationality coefficient beta is actually kind of modeling the confidence we have in our model of what the human's doing. Okay, so it's a very simple model, but we're doing this one parameter update. So we're, we're basically performing, um, in what we're doing, we're performing a Bayesian inference on this parameter beta. Okay, so, so in fact, if the person does, you know, they're moving towards the goal, and then suddenly they turn around for a reason that we haven't seen, what will happen is beta will update, the, the robot observing this will update beta, and then that probability distribution will become more flat. Okay, so here is, um, here's Sylvia. She's our human being in this experiment. She, they presented this at RSS here back in the, um, in the spring. And um, let's just get this going. Okay, so, um, so she's going to move around the lab, um, and she would be moving towards, you know, a goal, but then she sort of suddenly turns around 
um, because, well, in this um, experiment that we're doing, she's avoiding a coffee spill on the ground that the robot doesn't know about. So the idea is the robot would see, would sort of have a sense of her goals. Maybe they've learned, the robot has learned that beforehand. Um, but, uh, and so would think that the rational motion would be straight towards the goal. When she starts deviating that distribution, and let's just play that again, that distribution becomes um, quite a bit more flat. So we see, um, so we go through the motions. So here she is. Those, um, the probability distributions are actually emanating out of Sylvia right now. You can't see that very well, um, and you can't really see the path. So we have the data played back in the next screen in this kind of top-down view where, um, so Sylvia has these squares emanating from her, and you'll see that that distribution, albeit it's sort of happening fast, becomes quite a bit more spread out as she starts turning away from what appears to be her goal. So recently we've been updating this with multiple humans and robots. Now the robots are have to avoid not only the humans, there's more than one human, but um, themselves as well. So multiple path, path planning with multiple robots. We're using for the multiple, for the robots avoiding each other, we're using um, a technique we worked, we worked on earlier called sequential trajectory planning, where there's priorities given to um, each of the robots. One gets to plan its fast track path, and then that plan and the tube is used as an obstacle for the next vehicle. So even though they're planning at the same time, the, um, the obstacles are currently being updated um, based on the fast track computation. The humans, the um, algorithm that we're using is exactly what I showed in the previous graph with no interaction between the people um, that we're modeling, even though obviously in general there would be interaction between people. Um, and so there, there's a couple of interesting things. Even with no interaction, um, when the humans start um, acting maybe slightly irrationally for their goals, like um, this is Jaime and he's kind of walking in a little bit of a and, and then Sylvia has to sort of move around Jaime. You can see these distributions um, flattening out. And in effect, it's in a kind of artificial way capturing a little bit of interaction between them that we didn't model into the system. So, you know, this is um, just sort of a demonstration of how this might work in higher dimensions. Okay, so we've talked about um, We've talked about safety specifications, about reachability. We talked about some computation of backwards reachable sets for some example. Um, so the computation tool in general, we looked at some examples. Um, we looked at an application of that to pre-computation for real-time planning. And then we, um, we started looking at you know, an interesting problem of, of applying that around, around people. So in the last um, few minutes of the talk, I'd like to move to this part about now thinking how we might update these reachability computations as we learn more about the system dynamics. So kind of where we started today. Um, and so the very first thing that we did was to separate the two problems. We have a, um, so we have a, a reachable set that we've pre or we computed, pre computed based on a nominal model of the system. And, um, and then we'd like to um, operate within that reachable set, but learn as we're operating the system, gather data about how the system is operating and learn how to operate more safely while not violating that constraint set that we've computed via reachability. Uh, so let's just demonstrate this through examples. This is, um, this is a quad rotor that's tracking a step trajectory in altitude. It's just trying to go up and down, up and down in the lab. And um, it's envelope, so the, it wants to now stay within a pre-computed reachable set that we've computed so that you know, it doesn't crash into the floor or into the ceiling. So basically, it's got an envelope that it has to stay within. We've computed the maximal controlled invariant set within that envelope uh, based on the dynamics of the system using a nominal model with a, a disturbance in the system that we've over approximated. And so it's, it provides us with a conservative envelope. Um, and so we, we did that pre-computation. It's a little bit of an artificial example because after doing that pre-computation, we gave the quad rotor, it knows that envelope and it knows what control. So it knows the reachable set and it knows what control to apply on the reachable set, just like in the previous work that we showed. But we take away its own model. 
So it doesn't know its own model and it doesn't know a control law um, to track a desired step trajectory. It has to learn that in real time. So the, I mean, we, we call this learning to fly, although I, I think it's a bit of a misnomer because, you know, we're giving it a lot of information, right? We're giving it a safety envelope that it has to stay inside. Um, but it, you know, albeit it doesn't have a model of itself. Okay, so when it starts, the quadrotor drops because it doesn't have a model, it doesn't have a control law, it's just going to fall to the ground. But it doesn't hit the ground because it hits the bottom of the reachable set. And with that reachable set comes the control law that will keep it inside the reachable set. That actually causes it to bounce up and down a little bit on the bottom of the set. And it learns, we're just using a very simple learning scheme here, it learns that um, by applying a little bit of thrust it goes up. It knows the trajectory that it wants to track. That's the blue dash trajectory, just the step up and down in altitude. And so it always stays within the envelope because that's, we, you know, if it gets close to the envelope, we switch it to the safe control that we use to compute the envelope. Um, but after a while, it does a fairly good job of tracking that trajectory. The, the green indicates just you know, the control that it would use to try to track the trajectory. The red part of the tra trajectory is when it's using the safe control so it doesn't exit the envelope. So you see as it's coming down, it's starting to use the safe control because it, it doesn't want to crash. So it's modulating its vertical velocity so it, it doesn't crash into the, into the floor. OK, so, so this, this, we separated um, safety from learning here. We, we computed a reachable set on the nominal model. And, we, um, and then we updated, we kept the vehicle inside that reachable set. We, know we, we knew we could do that. And as long as it was inside that reachable set and not hitting the boundary, it was allowed to learn to try to do a better, to do a higher performance control, which just means track the trajectory. Um, so, it would be more interesting now as we, as we learn that, uh, you know, the, the model of the system, in fact, now we're going to be learning the disturbance function, the uncertainty in the system, to be able to use that information to update the envelope itself. So now sort of have a feedback which, as you, as you update the model from the nominal model that was used to compute the envelope, um, update the envelope because you have new dynamics. And so in the work that we've been doing over the past couple of years, we've been using um, a Gaussian process to represent the disturbance function. So the disturbance is varying over, over space, over the state space. So we're trying to, from the data collected in real time, we're trying to learn that function d of x, the disturbance function. And as we learn that function, we are, of course, we started with some nominal model and some nominal envelope. We're asking how we might update that envelope in a way that, um, uh, in a way that uh, maintains some kind of probabilistic safety guarantees on the system. So this is where you know, we're retracting from our guaranteed safety to, OK, now we're, we're, we're acknowledging that the model is wrong, and we want to relearn the safety function. Um, and so I, I would call this maybe aptly um, online disturbance model validation. So we're validating whether or not the model is um, correct. And if it's not correct, we're going to take action to update the safety envelope. So going back to the um, characterizes the sort of diagrams we showed at the beginning of the talk. We have some um, safety specification. We've computed some reachable set using a nominal model. Um, and then as the system is evolving, so we've got some trajectory, we, we get some data or some set of da data that's indicating that the disturbance function that we had been assuming when computing the original reachable set was wrong. In fact, um, in the case here, it's indicating that we weren't conservative enough, and so we have to grow the set. So what we do is we search for, and so we're using a level set of the set that we've already computed, which allows us to guarantee safety for the new disturbance function. So that's a fast computation, because we're already storing those level sets. So we're computing this. Um, uh, this, this basically this Bayesian structure, which is asking, is there a level set which validates my model, my safety specification for my model with that new disturbance? 
um, as you collect more and more data, you know, you, you, you have some learning rate. And, and this is what I don't really know how to do. I don't, I mean, this is where I, it becomes very system specific. How you decide over time that you've got enough data that that was really an anomaly. And, you know, you, you are actually, maybe you shrink your set. Maybe you don't shrink your set over time. Maybe it remains more conservative. Okay, so with the last experiment, so this is that same step trajectory. Um, and now we're, um, we've introduced a wind disturbance. So this is a fan. And it's providing a fairly significant wind disturbance in the bottom part of the lab. Um, and that's a disturbance that the system doesn't know ahead of time. So it still assumes it has its nominal model. It's got its pre-computed reachable set. And then we run two experiments in um, sequence, but we've superimposed them here. One is when it's not doing this online model updates, and one is when it's you know, measuring, oh, this disturbance is violating my model, I'm going to update the reachable set. So let's just end by showing that. Okay, so it's initially, um, so there, there's Kenne, he's turning on the fan. Um, it's initially flying um, up. Um, and um, you know, it's coming down, it hasn't hit the disturbance yet, but as it gets um, closer to the field of the disturbance, you'll see the, um, the trajectories start to deviate. So it's got this kind of ghost ship of the one that's not using the online model updates to the one that is. So what happened here? There was an automatic shrinking of, the, uh, of that, basically that reachable set, and it shrinks it to the point where the disturbance at the, that point or that set of points is validated with the original um, model that we had of the system. So it, it's validated with the new model that we have of the system with this new learned disturbance. So, you know, now it's just going to continue again. But basically, over time, you know, what you would like to be able to do is probe that region and gather more information about that disturbance. So I, I call it a kind of way, you know, these safety value functions as a way of, of bookkeeping your model, your safety specification in a way that provides you a kind of intuitive characterization of how far you are away and how far you are away from that safe set boundary once you start learning more about the system. Okay, so, um, and I, I don't have time to talk about the um, uh, dealing in unstructured environments. I think we'll, we'll go to our um, basically summary here. So we talked about safety using reachability analysis and um, kind of this idea of a hybrid system representation, which, um, you know, I, I think works well with systems, especially when you have humans in the loop and there's a kind of simplicity in organizing the behavior of the system into these different modes. Um, and then um, we talked about um, how to incorporate, or one way, maybe first steps in our group of um, incorporating new information um, from learning into a, a safety critical control system. And these, um, you know, there's a lot of questions. How do you update these sets in safety critical scenarios? Um, how do we model unstructured environments? That's a project that we've been working on now for about a year, or a couple of years, um, with navigating using vision sensors. Um, and uh, we're working on a number of other things. One of them is um, in those reachable set calculations, having a, an idea of a risk sensitive. So incorporating risk into the reachable set from the time that you compute it, rather than using a, a nominal deterministic model, use instead a model which, which captures if you have probability distributions about these variables, why not use them in the original, um, original computation? Okay, so let me conclude just by thanking uh, a whole bunch of people. These are some of my uh, former, some former students, and the ones in bold are, are current students who have been working on this research. Um, some of them are working joint, so Andrea Baichi and Jaime is, uh, Andrea is jointly working with Anka Dragan and me, and Jaime is, um, Fernandez Fizak is a joint student with Shankar Sastri and Anka and myself, um, and, uh, thanking the funding agencies for supporting this. Thank you. Any questions?
you know, your reachable sets say there exists a trajectory that will get you into the bad state, but many of them may, in fact, not get you in that bad state. And so there, it would seem to me that there are definitely there are situations where, in order to achieve some task, you have to transient through those yeah. And I assume that's what the, where the risk comes from. And that's why, you know, depending on how conservative your disturbance model is, that risk, um, you know, you, you could exactly do what you suggest. You could be computing no solutions when indeed there are very good solutions. Um, so if, if, if you had a, a mod, if you had a a, a distribution, some, some statistics of the disturbance, of the, let's just call it the uncertainty in the system, then it would make more sense to use that in the reachable set calculation. So we've been working with a, a, a stormwater um, design. Uh, it's a, a company that does control for stormwater design. And they, they design ponds and ca catchments as well as routes from pond to pond um, to be able to try to deal with um, storms of varying magnitude and there's a, the worst case the the design storm they call it which is the storm every 10 years which could flood everything um, and if you design you know for that worst case it's just over designed and you you don't have you know space to provide that level of volume in the pond so so there we're using this risk sensitive reachability because um, we'd like to be able to put a probability distribution around those rare events and and capture rare events but capture them in an appropriate context so Yes, that's something that it's, it's very recent work that we've just done, but we're using the uh, conditional value at risk um, metric to characterize risk and compute level set functions. Um, the dimensionality is something that we're working on now because as soon as you put that probability distribution in there, it adds dimensions to the problem that you know, weren't in your original state space description. There have been, um, it's, that's something that we've been doing. And there is a, a community, say, within, um, that, that's been working in reachability that's been focusing on stochastic reachable sets. So um, different formulations of, um, of uh, reachable sets where, for example, boundaries uh, now not representing a yes or no, they're representing probabilities of collision based on those um, distributions. And again, um, you know, there's, there's you know, different reasons we wanted to use CVAR, but there's the, the concept is the same. It's just that you add dimension, I mean, you, you get more information, but you add dimension to your problem from the, um, uh, basically you're, you're looking at the belief of your state as well as your state there. So there's additional state variables to consider. Because we um, we don't have to do that, but we thought, well, reachability treats game. So so let's actually let's capture you know the worst case where the planner is trying to get away from the tracker and the tracker is trying to. So it's like the original Isaac's homicidal chauffeur game where you know you're you're really capturing the worst case tracking error bound because you're letting the planner do its worst to try to get away from the tracker, which is. Um, which is trying to capture the planner. So because we had the flexibility in our framework of incorporating control and disturbance, we, we used it for that. That's a good question. What, what is our desired outcome? Um, I, I think in the end what we'd like to have is, uh, is, is something like a probabilistic reachable set that gives us where, where the, the sets themselves give us some value, the value in that set gives us some notion of probability of collision. Um, where 
you know, so it's not number, so it's some measure of how far you are away from violating a probability of collision is what I'm expecting. Um, you know, right now we're really just using, so what we've done so far is to use that deterministic computation and just sort of capture it using this new disturbance model. Um, but uh, we'll, what we'd like to do is to be able to use that um, Gaussian process model of the disturbance to come up with a stochastic reachable set representation. What we'd actually like to do, which is further than that, is um, you know, in unstructured environments, disturbances aren't coming in in the nice way that we've been considering. There are obstacles that will suddenly appear in front of you that you only detect until now. Um, we'd like to be able to somehow take this framework and, you know, combine it with a, a, a real, um, perhaps a, a, a vision-based navigation system, so a learned perception module and be able to try to understand how safety analysis like this could be used to characterize things like the uncertainty of the output of the neural net that is allowed so that you get certain probabilities, so that you're under certain probabilities of collision. But I don't know how to do that yet. I think that that would be, that, that would be kind of a goal. That's what the DARPA project that we're currently being funded by for this is asking. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>